this? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's like six. All right. Here's your match data. I've never seen this actually. Is yours? Oh, this is good. This is Dr. Finch. Send it to David. Send it to me. I didn't even give it. It's the higher one. <laughs> it's it's really not, it's not that <laughs> easy. So everybody, everybody wanted to be they wanted to remember those good old days of sitting in the lecture hall. So this is our total for Midwestern. There you go. Eighteen. I'm sure you can all read, and you guys all know which of you you are. Uh, this is where we matched in the MD world. <laughs> I mean, that's See, there you go. So I'll leave this up for y'all because apparently this is all news to you. <laughs> so there's the, uh, that's actually 19 because the one, yeah, the one, so that's the 19. I'm just saying, oh Jesus. Jared, you want to say Jared? Yeah. Well, I don't know who Jared is. Cool. Alright. Uh, oh. Jimmy's out. So, the DOs? Not Jared's. Eight? Yeah. Who's going to dance? Yeah. I don't think so. It's very informative. I'm glad you can help me. Doctors are going to the Dodgers. Doctors go ahead and like Dr. Sachs. Is it total 19? 27 total. Uh, yeah. It's two more than last year. <laughs> two more than last year. Uh, and then we, this is what the rest of the world did. So there was a hundred. This is total programs. This is the uh, uh, NRM. A or whatever. This is their this is their info. So six unfilled this year. I thought it was interesting. Everything else is kind of just ninety-two percent. Do you know if that six unfilled is actually? It is because I looked at the right on match day. It was twelve and fourteen unfilled before so. So six unfilled after so. So is it? No, they find them after. After so it's over. Or they get the Oh, yeah, or they can get What? 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 <laughs> and that's it. That's all the stuff that I got for you. And uh, we're going to turn it over to Conrad. Right. He's gonna, he's gonna we'll have everyone move to the front row. So we can just do, we can just have a round Come down table. here. We can have a round table discussion. So we'll have the square you. Yeah. Oh. So we'll have everyone move to the front row. What? Yeah. Okay. We'll see what you think. I'm going to smell you. <laughs>
we can go through or we can just talk. So but we'll start. Go ahead, Dane. Give us your give us your scroll. Yeah, you can't story. Hear me without this. No, no, use it. You have to use it. It's authoritative. <laughs> we're, we're recording it, so it kind of helps. I will, yeah, will re-say whatever you say. All right. This may be recorded for quality insurance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Dane Boyack. I'm matched to JPS, John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. And um, I guess, pearls of wisdom, I don't know that I would have a whole bunch unless you had specific questions, but um, I would just feel like... I should tell you guys to um, don't sweat it right now. I mean, prepare, do your best, but like, it's really not that hard to match into emergency medicine as it sometimes seems. So um, when you get the specific questions, I think I'd be better able to give you better wisdom. I don't want to just rattle on. So anyway, here you go. I'm Scott Barnes. I'm asked to Texas Tech El Paso. And I think the only, the only thing I wish that I had done that I didn't was do one of my uh, EM auditions earlier in the season. I didn't do my EM audition until like, late August, September. And by that time, a lot of the students I was rotating with had already received two of their letter of rec letters of recommendations. And by the time uh, Paris opened up, they were all ready to send in their apps. And I think going into the application process, that would have made me feel more comfortable. But also, I think a lot of programs, um, you know, maybe I could have gotten more interviews that way. I mean, everything turned out okay, but I think it would have been a lot less anxious going into the whole process. So that's my advice. And Ashley, good to meet. Um, I am the EMP person. Uh, so I mentioned it's a combo program, but I did have to do all the same EM stuff. So, like all the slurs, all that stuff I have to, had to do too. So I can kind of answer all those questions. Um, my wisdom would be when you are scheduling your audition rotations, BSAS is a lie. If you are waiting for BSAS to open, if you're waiting for the date of BSAS to open to submit your application, you will not get a spot, in my opinion. All of my auditions were um, scheduled before the BSAS date opened. And two of them was like, well, we have one spot left. And it was like two months before their BSAS date. So get, if, it, if you want a spot, email them, call them, get a spot because BSAS is fake. And then um, be nice to people and we will help you. So I'm Scott Simpson. I matched to JPS along with Layton, or Layton and uh, Dane. Um, so if you are a first year, I'd be very, very, very afraid. And if you're second, I'd be very, very afraid. If you're third year, I'd be very afraid. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so I would say that my biggest thing with, along with Scott is to get your your VSAS early. Like have a have a good strong rotation early on, like maybe July, and then have like your second strongest before October, and then the place that you really want to match, I would say have right right before October, because October is like the deadline for when you want to get your letters of recommendation in. It takes like four or five weeks. And it takes, yeah, it takes a few weeks. So if you're like, if, you're, if your audition rotation or your way of rotation is in October, you're behind the curve. Even though you can still get a letter even into January, you can still get a letter of recommendation at that point, but um, all the programs open up in October, like they, they, they look at your application and say if it's complete or not, and then you go to review. And so if you don't have two, and a lot of places want three letters of recommendation, slowies or slowers, or whatever you want to call them, they're, they're called slowies now. If you don't have three or places that are strong places for by October, then you're really behind the curve. And I mean, a lot of other, like the MD students don't have to worry about it as much, but we as DOs really need to worry about having good slowies by October. And in the place that you really want to match to, you should have maybe one or two rotations before that. And everyone can argue or agree with me on that. I would say at least one strong rotation in ER right before the place that you want to match. So you're in your top notch and then you can get a good slowy from that place as your second rotation. 
So between July and August, or July and October, you want to have your <clears throat> strongest place as your second or third rotation, and then you want to just kill it, like have differential, have your whole H and P, have a differential and a treatment plan by that rotation. So when you go audition at JPS, where I wanted to go, you're not like behind the curve, like trying to trying to get your H and P in order or get get your differential down or or try to figure out a treatment plan. You have already gone through one or two rotations and you're solid. And by that time, when they give you a letter of recommendation from that program, you're stellar, like you're like a really good applicant. And so when they interview you later, they can review that whole letter of recommendation. But if you're not getting a letter of recommendation from that, I would say after October, it doesn't really matter. Like you can go all the way to January-ish. Yeah. I would say three letters of recommendation and your top choice is probably your third one right before October. Thank you. Uh, all right, my name is Conrad Hill. I'm at Detroit Medical Center, Sinai Grace. Um, my words of wisdom come more from things not to do. Uh, you can learn a lot from my situation. Um, I was very on top of things, and I got two uh, audition rotations June and July, so that's very early in the process. The problem was my June rotation um, it was at a big name program that doesn't take uh, DOs, and so they they told me they were going to give me a really good letter, and they didn't give me a really good letter, um, and it, really hurt my application, and by the time I found out I got a bad letter from them, um, it was too late to get another audition rotation, and so I was stuck with a bad letter and a good letter, and so I didn't know if I should send it or not send it, so it was a mess, um, but fortunately I matched, and uh, so my word of advice is don't go to a place that doesn't have DOs, um, or it's not DO friendly, because it's just not worth um, the risk. Which found out. Well, it, was, it wasn't a bad letter. Though. No, it was. It was. It was like a, they didn't rank it. Right. It was a great experience, and I learned a lot. And they really liked me, and I got a good grade on the rotation. Um, but they <coughs> checked on the slowy box. They they checked. They will not rank me. Which it's like top third, middle third, bottom third will not rank, and they checked will not rank. So no. Oh, like Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt's yeah, an awesome yeah. rotation, so if you're not getting a slowy from them, I don't your name, but it's not even out there. Sorry. <laughs> Vanderbilt. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, because um, yeah, that's a bullshit move that you want anybody's part. It's recorded. It's Still, Vanderbilt is not. That's not a place you want to go to. Yeah. No, I don't want my name recorded. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, and I will echo what Ashley said. I follow the rules. Um, it's it's hard to get um, <coughs> rotation two visas. Visa visa is a mess. Um, if there's a program you really want to go to, email them and find out if they go through visa or if they go if they don't. Because some programs, I know Indiana, they were full before visa opened. I got the last spot Where two months before. Other last programs time. I asked, they only go through VSAS. Yeah. So if it's a program you're interested in, you just got to find out specifically from the program. Don't hesitate to ever send emails to the residency coordinator, and they're good about being in contact with you. Um, as far as the order, though, I think it, you just have to take what you can get a lot of times. Um, that's my advice. Yeah. Uh, my name's Layton. I match to JPS as well. Um, Word of wisdom, I don't know. Um, they kind of talked about getting your auditions early and slows and all that, slowers, whatever they're called. Um, I don't know, just preparing for auditions. Just get down like your differential diagnosis for all the common chief complaints, right? So chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, all of that stuff. And that way, when you know a differential, because the doctors don't want to know that you can figure out exactly what it is. They want to know that you can come up with a big list of what it could be and know what three or four life threatening things are and how to rule those out. And so that's how you're going to look really good is if you have this differential that's six or eight things long and, and a treatment plan to find out what, um, you know, how to rule things out. And so that's how you're going to look good. Not necessarily going into a room and getting a good history physical and then saying, oh, they have a upper respiratory tract infection. 
Oh, yeah, well, that's good, but what about all these other things that could actually kill that? You know, some, yeah. Well, I'm going to hit it later. So it's oh, okay. <coughs> All right, my name's Chantel. I matched at Doctors. I think I'm the only person here who matched to a DO program, so I can be some help for those who are interested in osteopathic programs. Uh, I think my pearls of wisdom, I, this is a little contradictory, but I would say not to do an audition in July. So that's when the residents start. I feel like programs really want to focus on training the new interns and not trying to see how well you're going to match into their program or fit in. So it's a really busy time for the hospital, and I chose not to do that. I did my ICU month that in July instead. And that worked out great for me because I got really good airway experience. And so then on my first audition, somebody's like, do you want to do this innovation? And I got it right on my first try. They're like, oh, we're impressed with you. Like, and so that was really, really, really helpful for me. Um, I also did not have as many problems with ESATs as some other people did. But again, I was doing some different programs. I think I got all of mine through ESATs. But I applied in January, right? So when you guys applied? Well, a lot of them don't, don't open until like March. Like well, you start early. looking, like you start, I start calling programs. <laughs> yes, I and, do too, yeah. Yeah, so start researching your program to start, like, it seems so, for me, I was really overwhelmed at the time because I didn't you know I wanted to do EM and I felt like we we're only six months into a third year and now we got to start setting up auditions and what if you find something you like greater, you know, later on. But I feel like if EM is what you want now, just set your auditions because they're hard to get and uh, you don't want to be without a score because unlike any other specialty, you need, it's everyone know what a slower is or a slowy, okay. And so you need those from residency programs and the only way to get them is to get those auditions. Um, and another pearl is I did three auditions. I didn't end up auditioning at doctors. I ended up going to a place I didn't audition at, but I did three different types of locations. So MD World is a little different, but osteopathic you have your level one training centers, uh, like Einstein, level two in Michigan, and I did a, like a community-based hospital in, in Rhode Island as well. And I felt that that gave me a good idea of where I actually wanted to practice and what kind of residency program I wanted to be a part of. These level one centers can be huge, 17 people per class. With four, three, three years of classes or four years of classes, that's a lot of people. So didactic days are 75 people in the room. And you can start, I sort of felt like I was more of a, like just a, what is it, not a peanut pot, but just a number versus a student, versus other programs I went, there was only four people. I felt like there was a lot more connection for me. So I felt that helped me get a really good idea of how I wanted to practice and what kind of program I wanted to be a part of, so. <laughs> All right, so I'm on the, in the same boat as Conrad. Like, I feel like I have, so, I, I was so fortunate to have matched, so I have like everything like to not do. One that I would not do is fail the PE, which you, you kind of laugh at, but, so here's the setup for that is, okay. If you do your auditions before you do the PE, like I, I was like, I was pretty confident in my clinical acumen in the emergency room, and so I just went out to the PE blind. You know, the PE is like a role playing scenario, and you need to know your role, and you need it's like a play. If you don't say the right lines, even if you're doing everything right, you need to know that patients are grading you, and they don't know a thing about medicine. They just know if you say the right thing. So. Make sure and study a book. Even though it seems ridiculous and it has an outrageous pass rate, you don't want to be one of the 5%. Like, so that's the first thing that happened fourth year. Second thing that happened fourth year is um, I would advise everybody to be very weary about whether or not they um, waive their right to see their letters. If you get a really good feeling, and <coughs> so I went to New Mexico, a great program, probably the most, as far as I'm concerned, like the most desirable program in the country. They wrote me a great letter and told me they were going to. Like they gave you, gave me good feedback. Then, um, uh, and then I went to Vegas. Didn't get like quite the, as good a vibe and everything. But then I checked my I checked my eval and they gave me an A for the rot rotation. So I'm like, okay. And so I submitted the letter that I had asked for, and they did not write a very friendly, like not a helpful letter at all. And um, and so I would. You know, if you get a good vibe and you get some good feedback, maybe go ahead and wave your right. But if you're curious at all, like at all curious about whether or not they're going to give you a good letter, I'd say make sure before you send it out to the programs. I have to say you can add to that. Some people, some programs will not even count your slow if you didn't wave your right. Yeah, right, so it's a little bit of a tough, a tough situation. Or if you, you assume that maybe you didn't get a great feeling, from that rotation, just don't use it. Yeah. Um, and that's the value in having at least three audition rotations is 
you have the luxury of, okay, I didn't feel real great about this program, maybe I'm going to hold that one. I didn't okay. ask for one. Like when I did a rotation, uh, Albert Einstein in Philly, one of the level one trauma centers, I did fine on the rotation, but like I said, you only do like 13 shifts in the EB, and you're with different people every day, and I felt like I never really got a chance to nobody, know anybody, and the person evaluating me or writing this story I never worked with or talked to, and so I was like, I'm not going to even bother with this, because I don't know what it's going to say, so I'm not going to waste anyone's time worrying about it. And it didn't matter. I already had other slores, and I had I did a community ED rotation in third year, so I already had three under my belt, but it came back to bite me when I interviewed at Lehigh Valley um, in Philadelphia, uh, not Philadelphia, but uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, because they're connected in some weird way, and they're like, well, why didn't you get you know, a slore from this, which I never thought would happen. I never thought a program would ask me. Why would I audition and not ask for a slur? But it, I asked, asked, yeah, because yeah. they're like, why did why don't you have a slur from here? And my answer was, I didn't have it yet because it was taking me forever. Like you just have to go. But I got asked that. Yeah, I got asked that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I did a rotation in Las Vegas kind of later in the year, and they were really late getting my uh, grade back, and so I just I had a, a slur from them, but not a grade yet, and so I just held on to it, and I ended up not submitting it at all. I got my grade from Vegas like last week. I <laughs> still have it. Me too. Yeah, it's it's a little slow. Yeah. The other the other pearl I would I would give would be don't don't divide your efforts. I did because I liked Kingman. I did a third year rotation there and I liked it. And so I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of straddle the fence and try to do DO and MD. I'd pick one side and stick to it. Um, That's and, it. That's a good point. I not for. Uh, yeah. uh, for the third years that are going in, that's you know that's a really good point. I did two auditions at combined programs. I felt like that was good enough, and most people didn't seem to matter. But when it came to interview season, like you, I never thought that I would be that case. But you do get burnt out from interviewing, and at the end, like you just don't want to go. You just don't care. Like you just figure something else out because you're broken, you're tired. And, um, so <coughs> when I a few uh, airports because of the weather, right? I did that. So you just. Tired. So when I interviewed osteopathically, they interview much sooner than MDs do. It's just the way MDs will interview into Jan late January. Most osteopathic programs are done by December. And so I'd already done like 12 osteopathic interviews by like December. And so all my MD interviews were in January. And I was like, forget it. Because like, what's the point? Because I don't want to withdraw from the osteopathic match just to do an allopathic. And so I just ended up canceling all, all my MD interviews. So if you're going to do both, make sure you balance it really well. There's six DOs or six MDs, because if you do it the way I did and waited it so heavy one way, you're going to end up just saying, screw it at the end. I'm not going to waste my time. Along those lines, I <clears throat> I did a third year at Kingman and got a letter of recommendation from that. So it kind of, kind of in a way, <coughs> it's the osteopathic route, but if I wanted to go that way, but I, like she said, you can't, you can't straddle Jared said, you can't straddle a fence. You really have to choose one side or the other because it's the way it's set up now. You just, you just waste too much effort on one side. You, you try to do both sides. And the AOA is kind of like a jealous mistress, too. If they, <laughs> if they see that you're like rotating at, uh, at some MD places, they can, it can hurt you at some of those programs, too. Yeah. So, yeah. The flip side of that, though, I, so I did this with you guys as well. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk for you. Okay. Everything okay. you say, I'm going to say. <laughs> So I, I did what they did as well. I went to Kingman third year, and um, I kind of used that as a warm-up rotation, if you will. Um, I mean, I would never have told them that, um, but that's in essence what it was. I don't know if you guys are able to arrange that anymore. I don't know if they're uh, going to allow you guys to do like a third year elective somewhere like that. Um, that counts as rural. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's my comment. I did the yeah. So if, if you can do that, I think that would be the one pearl that I would give, I guess, if I have any pearls, um, is do a third year rural emergency medicine rotation. You guys can still do that, right? Well, Not it's a little hard, right? Can you do it in there? I don't know. Oh, I, need to, I mean, you, can do it, but you, you have to be nice if you yeah. do If you do the core world, then you get a little for training, and that's how it's going to do it. Can't do a core. Can't do a core. If they let you do it, definitely go and do that because one, you're going to find out early on is well, you're going to find out if you really want to do emergency medicine. And secondly, you can get a letter of recommendation. I got one from Kingman, and it was 
pretty decent. I actually had a couple of interviewers at uh, MD locations say that they were impressed with that letter uh, from the VO program. So um, even though there are, I guess, some VO programs that don't like to go to the MD programs, MD programs are okay very much with VO programs. So, um, and then the last thing I would say is if you do that, it's going to prime you for your VO optician rotations. Um, I rotated at uh, Maricopa with some people who were fresh, like this is, that was their first EM rotation and you could tell they were like, uh, what am I doing? Whereas I had had that month up in Cayman where I was able to just come down and be like, all right, here's my differential, this is what I want to do. Um, so it was a smoother transition into auditions for me. It wasn't something that was super uh, difficult. It was flat in my face. All right, so we'll go through these. There's just some frequently asked questions. We'll just go through rapid fire. I kind of give the chronologic order of how the whole process works. And we'll just each take a question and we'll just go rapid fire through it. And if there's any question you have specifically, so this is like first, second, third year type stuff, <coughs> any specific questions on anything we're talking about, no, don't hesitate to throw up your hand. Or if someone wants to, if someone else has something to say, um, throw it out. I can answer the board score is very important. Just, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like people say, oh, there's numbers, but oh, I have friends who scramble, I have friends who, you know, and it came down to the board scores at the end of the day, whether or not you're scrambling. And so you can do a lot to build your application, but if you have a 500, it, you know, it, it makes a difference whether or not you have 500 or 650 or 700. So right. it, it, they just can't be understated how important board scores are. Yeah. All right, Dan, you want to take question one more? Sure. Um, all right. I'll do this here. Application. So I got asked on multiple interviews what type of leadership experience that I have and how would that relate to how we would do in their residency. What would I contribute to their residency based on my experiences that I've had in the past. And so I was involved in a number of different clubs, the EM club, the Medical Hispanic club, I did a couple different projects here and there. Um, one of them was like putting together a little medical Spanish um, vocabulary sheet, like a little like mock interview thing. Um, and actually uh, there was at least that I can recall, two of the program directors were like, dude, I want to copy of that. I want to see that. You know? So just be proactive, get involved, do something, and um, have something to show for it afterwards. So that's what I would say. I, I, I think one of the things that actually may, may have been a factor in saving my application, as I said, it was, it, I had some problems, was the fact that um, I did some research at the University of Utah between first and second year. And it was it was a great research project, and they were it was actually they were really good to work with. They're not good about getting you into a residency, but they're they're really good to help let you come up and do some research. So I would recommend doing emergency medicine oriented research that you can, and then being able to talk about it and kind of be able to talk talk about how you would want to direct like take that research further and that sort of thing. And that I had a lot, almost every interview had a pretty good discussion about what research I was involved in. Which kind of sucks because it's a lot of work, but um, it's it's worth it in, in the end. All right, uh, Scott. Number two. Number two. Well, she already talked about public okay. scores. But you have a third year. Um, so, so what are competitive then? So, oh, competitive board scores. So what is, what's the score you mean here? So, shoot. I mean, so NRMP publishes statistics. What I understood was like 235 is kind of like the average. Was that last year? 225 for US Emily? Yeah, I'm not sure about Conlex. Conlex is like 550? Does that sound right? So, yeah, I think I so 225 is the MD. No, 245 <coughs> is a 71 MD score. But that's skewed because the, M, the DOs are, at a higher, are, are expected to have a higher score than that if you're going to take. Yeah, and, and right. slot. I mean, so about two thirty is. It probably depends on the program. I, I'd say it's very program specific. I mean, um, if the program director is a DO, like there's quite a few of them actually. I mean, he's not going to look on you any less than if you're a DO or an MD. So it, I, I think it's pretty program specific. But I think it's important to understand what part of what they use those scores for. They get a thousand plus applications for ten spots. And they need an easy way to pick who they're going to even read their application. No one's going to read a thousand applications. So the first pass, they have a number, and every program is a little different, but they have a number, and 
tomato soup, you're not above that number, you're not getting red. And I think you get put to the side until. And that's probably the majority. I really think they're, Obviously, all of them. And I think they're harder on you guys. Like, you know, Maricopa, like, a lot of like people said that you can't get any, even an interview in Maricopa unless you're about two thirds. Uh, step one, and that's I, probably true for the MD stuff too. And a lot of MDs, I mean, yeah, like a lot of MDs, like if you're competing for the same slot and the average MD score is 225, like are they going to take you over an MD if it's an MD slot and you have a 225? Like you have to kind of think in those ideas because the ego factor does play a play a role in some of the stuff. So it is program specific. Some are much less like, less uh, what's the word yes. biased. And I think it's good that, you know, I know some MD programs take comlinks, but I know I've heard a lot of MD program directors say they don't know what that means really to them. Yeah, and I so it's hard for them to judge it. And so if you're considering, and I took, I ended up matching DO, but I took both step one and step two of the assimilated. I mean, you're studying for the same test, so if you want to get your 500 bucks, just take it. It's a day. Yeah, I would say even good. if you plan on just going DO, I would still take it because you might change your mind and you might want to do a different specialty altogether. So if you're studying for both of them, the preparation is the exact same. I think it's definitely worth your money and time to just take step one. Use the complex as a practice test. If you and, want. And nobody wants to scramble, but it happens. And if you've got to do some elite scores, then that helps. And no program director, there's there's equations to convert complex to US money. But no, no MD director wants to convert your score. He wants to compare apples to apples. Again, and he doesn't know the validity pass. of the complex test, and you know, if he can say your step one is this and the other students is this, then that always helps. Um, just an interesting statistic, though, that I read um, from the Western Michigan's website. The program director there is a, he's a pretty well-renowned um, figure in the emergency medicine world. He has a 12-page advice on how to match into an res emergency medicine residency on their website. It's a great resource, but in there he said that 70% um, of people that score a 190 still match. So, I mean, that's you, you want to be greater than you know a 70% possibility, but I wouldn't use board scores entirely to. I wouldn't be discouraged if you if you don't score the 235 or the 240. It's still very possible. You may not be able to go and handpick your resume. Yeah, you can definitely overcome a low, low board score and still match, but um, you might not get your top Yeah, exactly. Okay. Actually, is there any different ones? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Oops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, 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 so I wanted to go to Indiana as one of my top choice for like a long time. And so I knew I wanted that one. So I got that one and then I worked my other ones around it. And I did my other two before Indiana. Um, and also where I decided to move in was where I got them. I think some people would agree with that. You apply a bunch and you cross your fingers and uh, say a little prayer and then you go to them. And I tried to apply to places only that I knew took videos so that at least would be worth my time. Um, I actually ended up not ranking one of my auditions because I hated it. So it's also kind of nice. You kind of really learn a program. Um, and then as a, how many should you do? I actually had set up four. And by the third one, I was like, there's no way and I'll do another one. So I actually canceled my fourth one because I didn't really care about it. I think four is way too many. I think you would want to just MD counterparts yourself. only do two. Yeah, I liked they do doing one of their home choice. Yeah. Which is their home like facility. Uh -huh. And then they do one away. So when they they're assuming four it's away, crazy. they're like, I think we're completely nuts. So I did three and it was a little bit much, but I'm glad I did three. Um, I think you need two slows. I know I, I think two is fine and then you have two other specialty, like good applications uh, good um, letters from third years. Like I had a psych. But I had Psych and NICU were my other two, and obviously I did PEDS, so I needed a PEDS one. But Psych and NICU, and then two slows, and uh, worked out well. So that's what I would say. At least two slows, yeah. and wherever you can. And I love, I love, I love something there. Yeah.
or one other thing that you might want to consider is doing a subspecialty of emergency medicine. Um, so you can do your two audition rotations and have those be like your, you know, your hardcore auditions. Um, I actually did a um, rotation in ultrasound at Maricopa Medical Center. And I did that before I did my two real auditions. Um, and that helped on a number of levels. One, I got to know the assistant program director there very well. She wrote a very good letter of recommendation for me because I worked with her hand like, every day. Um, in addition, oh, and, and I should also uh, mention that those letters that you would get from those types of rotations, those are not slows or slows. Um, they are very similar. It's just like, a, hey, this is somebody that I would recommend. So it's considered a, um, a letter from an emergency physician, of course, but it's not one of the slows. <coughs> um, so that's something to consider. In addition, um, when I went and I actually did my real audition rotations, I had a month's worth of experience doing ultrasound. So when all of the residents who are brand new as of July come in and they're like, hey, we got ultrasound this guy, and they're kind of like, how do I work this machine? You know, they're like, press this, do this, and turn that knob, and get this going. They're quite impressed, and they appreciate your help, and if you're not a show off, but you're actually trying to help them, they will um, kind of help you out when it comes to your evaluation and whatnot. So that's something else to consider. There's lots of other uh, kind of subspecialty EM things you can Ultrasound is probably one of the more common ones. There's other things you can do. You can find the <coughs> You can do EMS. You can do whatever. Fox. Fox. Yeah. Fox. Part of Fox. Fox. But yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so just look at that. And uh, if you don't want to do three straight EM rotations, maybe you make one of them a little bit so that you can really stay on that. I think it would be dang hard to impress someone on Tox. So just say <laughs> 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 I did ultrasound too. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I did at mine at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, but it was probably by far the best rotation I had all year. So fourth year? And you, if you guys are interested in the end, like, I cannot recommend that enough. Because you're just going to be so much better than everyone else when you walk inside the ED knowing how to work it, knowing what to look for. I mean, looked at, you know, 75 cardiac exams and 250 fast exams before anyone else even touches an ultrasound. It's just going to make life a lot easier for you. So and it's fun. You make your own schedule. And all you got to do is ultrasound. You don't have to do anything else. You're like, oh, you want ultrasound? No, it's good. And then walk away. And that's it. You just do that for eight hours a day. It was awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. so I just saw the next one. I have to get one and I'll give it back. All right. It's my favorite tip. <laughs> okay. There's a podcast called EM Basic. Has yes. everyone heard of this? Woo! See? It is so great. It, he's a little bit dull to listen to, I think. I don't know. I also really love Emrap. No, but Emrap, do you listen to Emrap? Yeah. It's so hilarious, and you learn a ton. Yeah. So if you can do all the podcasts basically for EM Basic, and then you can start MRAP, because MRAP's a little, like, step above, I guess, knowledge-wise. Uh, they're great. They'll help you build those differentials. Like, he just does a whole chest pain. He does a whole abdominal pain, a whole <coughs> everything. So a whole podcast on just how to work up this, these certain complaints. And there's a really good one that's how to present a patient. Oh, yeah. That and on his website, he has a little pocket card with exactly what to put on your presentation and what order to do it, and it's so good. Anyways, that's my biggest tip. So along with that, there's one there's one website that our our um, program uses. It's called cdemcurriculum.org, and that one's more for like visual learners and stuff like that. But it goes along with everything she said, like MRAP and that, is that you. Um, Use a they they use like a type of abdominal pain or something, and they go through the differential and then the tests are ordered by that. So I would say that that would probably be third after if you're listening to the like MRAP and what was the other one? Um, EM basic. EM basic. EM basic, basic is basic. awesome. And then once you kind of really got MRAP, you'll you'll kind of really try. You'll know EM basic. EM MRAP. MRAP too is a really good. <coughs> What's that? M oh, yeah. MRAP. great too. It's it's best, all about us. Rap and EM Crit are more directed towards residents and interns. EM Basic is more medical yeah, students. You gotta have a little bit more of basic stuff. So, so like traveling to your rotations or wherever, that's like a good one. Where I did it like to. third year. Like third year in whatever, I'm going to OB, I'm listening to EM Basic, EM basic in the car. Yeah, that's so CD, CD EM curriculum is one that my program uses in like using like <coughs> the differentials and stuff. Okay, so when you're like actually like, say like you're actually seeing a patient, and now you're supposed to present to the attending, 
and they have some weird complaint, and you're like thinking, what crap, what's the, what's the differential that I should be given for something like this? There are applications that you can grab. I have two that I like. Does anyone have any suggestions? What? Yeah, that's you guys answer. need to have that. <laughs> What's that? Diagnosaurus. Diagnosaurus. Make sure you get it because it's like it allows you to look up any complaint, any symptom, and it gives you like a list of this is what it can be. So you know you're going to get drilled on what is the differential for your patient. You just look it up real quick before you go, and then you go in and bam, bam, bam. And they're like, ooh, this is awesome. And always have three of your every yeah, at least three, three, three differentials. And maybe a fourth one That's just be I like, just and it's probably not this. Yeah. It's probably not lupus. You can always put lupus in there. It's probably not lupus. Wiki EM. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. That was my, I have two that I use even today on my, yeah, that was, that was the second one. Um, even today, I'm on a pediatric fourth year rotation, and I still use these two applications for EM. And it's, one is Wiki EM, and that has the, huge, the biggest data bank, Wiki EM. And the second one is Palm EM. And those are the most helpful in anything. So like I can put in abdominal pain or uh, uh, what's the, the Ottawa ankle rules or you know like pancreatitis, anything like that. And it will bring up the differential, the treatment, the diagnosis, and then like the management and whatever like that. Right. Admitting orders and all this stuff. Like those are like crucial, like even even interns and second and third year EM residents will use those curriculum. And then like stuff like case files and stuff, like that's good for like the shelf exam that they do here, or like the tests that they do here. But really that's like such a general knowledge that um, it's it's sometimes difficult to read through and stuff like that. But that's still a good good resource. Yeah, so there's a ton of resources if you guys have any other questions for that. So we talked about fully quite a bit. Um, it's a standard letter of evaluation. It's just really a formula. They just check boxes, and there's a little section. You should read it. You can Google emergency <coughs> medicine slowly. You should all be familiar with it. It's a very cold-hearted form. It's very cold. <laughs> yeah, there's no like a like subjective data. It's yeah, like, like a tiny final. little like, two lines at the bottom. They can say you were cool or not cool, but right. it's all the check boxes. So it's a pretty cold, hard letter, and so. As far as how many you need, um, I think two or three. I think <coughs> three is the ideal number. But and then um, how do you get a good one? Um, definitely, if you use those resources, you have a good fund of knowledge. They're not going to expect you to be, you know, a genius and have always have the answers. Um, but if you're willing to learn, you show up on time, you work hard. Really, you shouldn't have a problem getting a good letter. It's not, you probably heard some, you heard some horror stories, but it's not, it's not hard generally to get a good letter. You know, just do all the things that Dr. Spiker talks about professionally. I think he's right. right. Oh, like you get, if you get a bad vibe from them, just don't. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, like, that's why you don't go in. But showing up on time and saying to at least the end or later, I think it really speaks volumes. Yeah. I've seen other people who aren't usually in and leave early, and the doctors will say something after they leave. And, just anytime they offer to do for you to do something, just do it without hesitation. Like I'd love to do that. I'd watch. I'd love to watch. I'd love to participate. Even if they ask you, like, would you like to do a rectum? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I would, I would love, love to do it. it. And I just, so I do it. And participate in didactics. I think it's one of the most important things. Like these didactics to show that you're paying attention, to show that you're reading the articles that everyone else is reading, that you want to be a part of the group. Um, I, they loved it when we raised our hand and asked questions during didactics. So that really helped. And what and questions? <laughs> Um, during the rotation, asking residents questions, it just shows you're interested. And maybe if you don't even have that question, a lot of the feedback, a lot of the feedback I got where areas I could improve was ask more questions. Because if you don't ask questions, it almost looks like you're not, you don't care. So just always come up with questions, always look like you're interested um, in what you're doing and what's going on. So that was You'd be surprised at how many of our MD counterparts don't really care. Like they feel like they're such a shoe in for everything that they don't really try a whole lot. And so you stand out a lot when you ask a lot of questions. When you're like, even verifying your information that you already know. When you're like, hey, this is what I remember. Do you, what do you think about this?
this, like that, that goes a long way, actually. You never complain. I don't think it's weird, but we have people who are interested in complaining about shift hours and stuff. And it really stands out when you hear people, like, everyone's there, everyone's tired, so never complain about being tired or having to work. You're never hungry. You're never hungry. hungry. Like, I know it seems weird because you want to be like, I'm so hungry, but nobody wants to hear you complain because they're hungry and tired, too. So, like, bring your residents food. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> I was just going to say a good mark of a place that you want to go is a place that will be willing to feed you, though. Yeah. Like, or that it's they're like, hey, you should go and grab something to eat. Because <laughs> yeah. people that don't offer you that basic human need <laughs> are it's it's cruel. cruel. It's cruel. <laughs> it's like, it's like, like <coughs> hard to something to do whatever you want to do. Right. Yeah. But um, something else that I uh, would tell you too is yeah. that. If, and this might sound cliche, but make sure that like, halfway through the rotation, or even after, you know, halfway through your shift, don't do this repetitively, but ask the person you're reporting to, hey, how are my presentations? Are they too long? Are they too short? What should I do different? Um, because sometimes you'll have somebody be like, dude, you just shut up and tell me what's wrong with the patient. Let's go in and see him. You know, other, other times you'll have the same. It's a bit more like, okay, you need to tell me a lot more details. You need to what the line of breathing is. And, the whole plan and everything. So it's very um, dependent on the person you're working with. So make sure you're getting constant feedback from them, especially if it's a different person every time. So just ask, hey, what should I do differently? How can I improve? And uh, that will come back and, and help you out too. That, that pays dividends. Um, aside from that, working with the residents, um, you'd actually be surprised how much feedback the residents get. Um, I don't know if you two know this, but at JPS, for instance, and this is not directly related to the letter, but um, at JPS, what they do when they're um, ranking everybody is they say, okay, hey, here's a picture of this kid, and he's applying here, we're thinking of ranking him highly. What do you guys think about this? Um, and then they're all just like, oh, no, 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 that kid's not coming here, right? And so it's, you've got to make good relationships with the residents, make a good impression. Um, and that'll help you out too. And in some places that you're rotating, uh, you have uh, the residents actually give you an evaluation. It's not just the attending, it's the resident on um, each shift. And so, again, you need to be making yourself not just um, helpful to the resident, but make it look like you are eager to be learning, you're actively involved. Go around and round on your patients that you, uh, you have brought into that resident, presented to that resident. Um, and maybe that went to like half hour, 45 an hour of your basis or something, make sure you're just following up with them. You're not just, hey, here's a new patient, here's my presentation, okay, I'm going to get another one, hey, here's a new patient. You know, you follow up with the patients that you have, make sure that you're checking up on their labs, their x-rays, things like that, and just come back and say, hey, the lab came back, and share with the patient, you see that again. Like, half the time, if you're like, yeah, you're still going to shut up and let me work, every time you're like, hey, great, I'm glad you're in book. So, just kind of be as proactive as you Yeah. I had something I was just going to say. You always have something to read with you, EM related. So whether it's the journal articles for didactics, or you print out a chapter in Rosen's or Tintinelli's, I got specific feedback about my reading EM related materials in between patients when I didn't have anything else to do. Like they specifically said, this shows you know dedication and motivation and whatever. And so looking at your phone, I do that a lot now, but it's, <laughs> it's never good when you're on auditions. <laughs> Okay, I have one, and I don't know that everyone knows this, but most programs, the assistant to the program director, so like the secretary, they have veto power. If you are mean to them, and you piss them off, and you do not turn in your paperwork, they can say no. And I know it sounds crazy that the secretary can ruin your career, but they can. So be nice to people. And I know, like, I'm actually in Indiana, and I was friends with my secretary, and when I saw him on my interview, when I went back, like, he came up to me and gave me a hug. It helps you. It makes a huge difference. Even nurses. Oh, yeah. Even nurses. I've seen a nurse come up. JR Ford, in oh, our yeah. rotation, in our residency now, he actually, I saw a nurse go up to the program director and say, I like him. You should keep him. Yes. You should look at Late him. hugged all the nurses. He gave him a kiss. Every time. Every time. <laughs> Come down with me. And they were male nurses. Oh. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I got helped out by a lot of, well, of gay nurses. Like, they would go, no, they would like, because if you offered a, 
this happened on several auditions where I'd like offer to just do something. Like I wasn't doing anything, and I was like, just like, hey, the patient wants to leave. I'm gonna unhook him. You just let him know that you're gonna take him off the monitor. And like a nurse went to the program director, like in front of me, in front of her. He's like, that guy helped me out. And it was, it wasn't. Yeah. Be nice. Be nice, to everybody. It's so important. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Like that's such a common sense thing. I know, but so so many Some people are like, oh, it. so like they're mean to the janitors. Don't be mean to the janitor. It's like normal life sense, but a lot of people don't have that. No, but it's true. <laughs> 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 they can take it right to you, and it seems silly, but they can. So if you need right. to be mean to somebody, be mean to your family and kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think we talked about this. Do you have any questions wife. about MDDO specifically? We'll move forward. All right, ladies. <coughs> Where can we find information about the programs? So, I went to Frida online. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah, so I went to Frida online, it's F-R-E-I-D-A, all capitalized, and they'll have, you know, you can just say, you can categorize things by state, by specialty, and they'll tell you all the programs that participate in Harris, I think, maybe even all the programs, I don't know. That's where I went, they'll give you Salary, how many years they are, there's three and four year programs. They'll give you the website that you can go to. You know, there's just a wealth of information. That's where I went to research all of my programs. Does it say MD or DO for their matches? Frida's only MD. Yeah, yeah, so Frida's only. But does it, does it show if they took DO students? You gotta go to their website, you gotta look at their yeah. current residence, and you gotta look at their schools. So I, as a Frida does list that, that, but it's generally not accurate. Yeah. Uh, so. I've made, for anyone interested in osteopathic medicine, <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I, am. I have made a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet for all DO programs. Um, it was handed down for me from a fourth year last year. I have added to it, and it is basically like a Frida for osteopathic. And so it goes from everything from the area to the salary to, you know, what their board scores are, the attending to resident ratio, hours, things like that. And so it's a compiled list. In addition, because I was applying to MD, I went through every MD program. Organized them by state and city, and then listed whether or not they had DOs in their residency class and how many they had them. That's so you guys, so if anyone's interested, I can get your emails and I can send that out. To the doctor, you just add the Excel spreadsheet thing. Um, I just got Excel spreadsheet for just the program that has pretty much what you said, how many DOs, how many you know states, and that. but I also have how many Midwestern students they've taken. I mean, in the classes right now, it doesn't cross for a while, it's on the spiker, kind of get more short ranges for the, uh, for the students. <coughs> so it's not done yet, but if you guys want it, feel free to let me know. Right. So Connor kind of told me to take the next one too. How did you decide what programs to apply to? I applied pretty broadly. Um, I bought into that whole <coughs> medicine is getting super competitive and you need to do a lot of applications. So I applied to like 55 programs, I think. Um, I applied to all the programs in the West. I looked at how many DOs they took, if they took DOs, um, what cities they were in, things like that. I tried to avoid the cold. That's good. Um, but mostly, to be honest, it was if they took DOs and how many were in their program, and if they took Midwestern students specifically. Are you interested in company now? Oh, is anyone? So, a couple times, so our criteria was a little bit different. We had to apply to, well, she matched psychiatry, so, you know, it was like making a spreadsheet for both me and her and combining it, and we ended up applying to 50, 50 programs combined as well, so. What do you feel like a good number is? I know it depends on how competitive you are, but what would you consider like a, a safe number? Yeah, I think yeah. it's a good number if you have a decent application. If you're scared or your board scores are low, then you're kind of want to apply it more, more, more broadly. What happened with emergency medicine is two years ago, no one feels bothered. and people freaked out like this is dermatology. And so for our year, it was just ridiculous. Program directors, I talked to so many program directors about it, but they just didn't know how to handle so many applications. Um, and they got screwed. There was 14 programs that didn't match. And there was quite a few good programs that actually didn't match. And it, it was because they, they didn't know how to handle so many applications. They're just guessing who to interview, and it's, it's like false. It's yeah. false. 
They get 1,400 applications, but right. that's because people are applying to 50, 60. And people are interviewing it. When I talk to kids, they're interviewing almost 20 programs. It's like just, I've been 25 it's, programs. It's, it's just unbelievable. They, they, the, the MDs have been told, like rotating away, rotation Stockton, they've been told by their programs to interview more and more because because of that one year where there's no slots available. Wait, is it more competitive? I don't know. I, don't, I think it's about the same as it's always been. So some of them were doing like 14 or 15 interviews, yeah. but that is false. But they, everyone else is doing it, so you almost have to. So if you have a good application, 50 is probably a good number. If I, mean, I did 38. I did 35. So, so I think getting 10 40. interviews is what's important. 40. Making sure you get that golden number 10. Got a great application. No, that's forty-two and a half. We're not a We're not as cold as people applying to that high of a number. To be honest with you, really so fast. Yeah, when I was in the you're the outlier. If you have a great application, Dan's like I had three applications. So I can expect. I mean, I ranked one. I dropped the other two. Anyway, so you can expect to hear back positive. Invites from like maybe half of the people that you uh, apply to if you have a reasonably strong application. Um, I mean, it's, it's up to you guys to your money, but I mean, it's expensive. So, so I, I didn't have the same experience that Dane did. I applied to 50 yeah. programs and I got 12 or 13 interview invites, so that's like one in five, a little more than that. So that's like 20%. So, um, and I felt like that was a pretty Similar story when everyone else that I talked to. So, you kind of got to know yourself a little bit. Too. You gotta yeah, you got to know yourself. You got to know your voice. Know no, no, you know, you can take a serious look at yourself and, and know, okay, hey, I'm pretty competitive, I'm really competitive, or I'm not that competitive, I'm going to apply to 100 programs. I thought it was competitive, I applied to 40, and then, uh, I didn't really get any interviews, so then I, had to apply to, <laughs> then I had to scratch one of my letters and apply to four more programs, so. They still got in. Um, all right. <coughs> interview. So, we'll speed it up a little bit. Speed it up. Take us through yeah, two minutes, go. Oh, two minutes. Interviews are going to be different at every program you go yeah. to. It's, if you can find out what the interview's like beforehand, that's great. Um, I had places where I interviewed with eight different people. That's eight inter interviews for that program. Some places it was just two. Some places it was, it was a group interview. So I had like five people in the room. Or I'd have like four different stations with two people at each station. And the questions vary to, you know, talk to me about your weaknesses and your strengths and like the projects you started on campus to what's your favorite TV show. So I had some really laid back interviews and I had some really, really intense interviews where they had, like tissues out and they're like, they're gonna make me cry. Kind of like med school again. Yeah. And so my, my experience in interviews was just, um, I had a book, I think, uh, what was it called? It was a, it was a red yeah, book. Yeah, Successful Batch. No, it was, it was just like 20 ways or 200 tips to succeed during the residency matching process or something. It was a red book. It's like the only book that's really out there to how to match, like how to <coughs> match correctly. It has like, 400 questions and so I kind of like just browse through them and I rehearsed and that helped me a lot just to make sure you don't want to be too stoic but just to make sure you kind of know what you're going to say like you don't want to be caught off guard really because I'll I stumble and I make my face gets red and so I like to be very very well prepared and, and so practicing was really important for me and I felt like I listened to this interview one time where people say you study so hard in med school and then you study so hard for boards and then Everyone kind of lets it go for the interview process. You don't really put that much energy into it. And this is this is a make or break situation. I mean, if you get an interview, it's a really good sign, and you could really hurt yourself in the interview. I think it's like a third of people worsen their chances during the interview yeah. by not knowing what they're talking about, not knowing their own research, or really not really being well prepared. So I think putting that energy into the interview process is really important. And I think as a general consensus, I don't think anyone pimps you. Did anyone get pimped on no. there? No, 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 only the no. worst hospital that I ever went to. Yeah. <laughs> if you get pimped in your view, don't go there. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> not true. Doctors hospital. <laughs> I went there. They were my first I, choice. I went to this hospital and I was really thinking they should be begging residents to come here. <laughs> and they pimped me. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm a warm body. That's better than <laughs> don't go there. They pimp you. Basically, in the interviews, you need to show that you're like a really cool guy, cool guy like Conrad or Dane. Sure. Or like, or maybe like it. Yeah, the other thing that <laughs> I would say too is you actually have a lot of control over those interviews. I mean, very few of the interviews that I had were like,
like, okay, sit down, just I'm going to ask you questions. They, they're very conversational, and um, <coughs> if you answer their question and then kind of spin it back and ask them a question, so it's not like, okay, ask me all your questions, and then I'm going to ask you all mine at the end. Make it a conversation. It's much less intimidating. It's a lot easier. The interview time slot is like that, and uh, you're up and out of the room before you know. So. I think that how are you today? How are you doing? That's like the most important question that you'll get because that's how you start the whole interview. Because you can just like bullshit with them. It's just like so much better. I mean, really. A lot of that, in a lot of interviews, just pick out something and say, tell me about this and talk. And they always ask you, they always ask you any questions. You always have to have questions. Yeah, You're going to get that talk. question maybe 4,000 times through maybe the whole process. Give me questions. Give me questions. So pick out your questions yeah, for each have person. Standard have questions you ask five everyone. questions you ask. And even if you don't even care the answer or you know the answer, ask them. <coughs> you'll get asked 4,000 times. Give me questions. And you really won't care. And okay. if you don't think you don't have any questions, you just. One of mine was, it was good for everyone, was what is your best off service rotation? I asked that to, you can ask that to anybody. Like the, the residents, or the you just ask, what's your, what do you think is your best officer dissertation? And you get a different answer almost every time. So you can ask that one, or I mean, there's a lot. Just pick out your questions, but have something for everybody. I think a good question to ask. You guys, you guys all did resident dinners the night before, right? Yeah. So EM, I don't know if it's like this for any of the program, but then I prefer every interview with the night of, depending. You all did dinner with the residents out someplace or at the house or something. And I, I found it really helpful to find out if residents have been kicked out of the program in the past. And so I think it, that's the good place to find out about red flags. You don't want to be asking the program directors exactly if they're they're weak in a lot of spots. But then I find out, oh, they don't have picky rotations or they don't have picky rotations. And this is where you can find out a lot of the, maybe this is not the place that that's for me kind of stuff. I would say be, be outgoing on those dinners because they were so boring at times. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody, me and Dane were joking around at one of the dinners because everybody's like trying to be like nice and like, and, and formal and stuff like that. And it's the same thing over and over again. So like by the time you get to your 10th interview, everyone's like, oh God, this is the same thing over and over again. But if you go out, if you're outgoing, if you talk about the residents, about the family, and you joke around them a little bit, if you're outgoing, like that says wonders to a lot of people. And, and just, you think it's common sense, but just act interested. Like somebody said that to me once, and I thought, it was the dumbest, I thought it was the dumbest yeah. advice I'd ever got, but it, it's true. Like, by the 10th interview, you were so burned out, and it's the same thing over and over again, and everyone is always asking the same questions, but if you just act interested and outgoing and kind of, like, lighthearted and have fun with it, then that, make, that, goes, that makes a lot of On a related sense. note, that same resource that I talked about on Western Michigan's <coughs> website, he said, like, and I thought it was really good advice, it's, it's, Never safe to assume that anything that happens throughout the course of your interview, through like dinner and everything, that it's off the record. Like they, they'll tell they'll tell you that until they're blue in the face, but you can botch it for yourself at any point in your time there. So don't get drunk. Yeah, and <laughs> like I mean, it sounds crazy, crazy, but it's not it's not a far fetched to Louisiana believe that like yeah. I mean they'd be baiting you like here here's some liquor here's some liquor you know. And Baton Rouge like I've heard the stories Baton Rouge trying to get you drunk because they're trying to get you so drunk that you'll be stupid. No, it's fine to drink, but I personally I will be honest. Drink, like we had drinking games, but like you everyone was doing it. And one of the ones they got it all the time. Did you feel guilty? But it was, I knew the program. <coughs> Did you get yeah. an eye opener? I'm being guilty of everyone. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but the dinners are a great opportunity to really talk to the residents and really get a feel for it. It's so hard to get a feel for a program one day in a day. I feel like it's impossible. Yeah. You really don't know about, yeah. But so, they don't know about you. I missed, I missed a couple of dinners just because like missed flights or whatever, but I brought scrubs with me. I just said, hey, I've got a couple hours. Can I hang out here and eat for a few hours? And that, I think, gave me a good feel for kind of how things run, even though I wasn't able to really spend time with them. That's actually a good point. Oh, that's a good note. Yeah, about okay. second looks. Did you guys get to talk? So you guys ever heard of the second look? So you guys know that some programs, some programs are, I think, unethical. <laughs> um, well, some programs are after me. Well, after the end of the interview, they'd be like, if you didn't audition there, be like, you know, it's really hard. It really is hard to get to know a program. So if you'd like to come back and do a shift, you're more than welcome to. And I got that offer from every program I interviewed at that I didn't audition at, and I didn't do it for any of them. And I think that's okay. And I got really worried about that because 
I felt like maybe they weren't going to think I was interested enough. But being out of state, like it was, it was complicated to fly out there and For bury. I spent ten thousand dollars interviewing and auditioning, so I didn't want to spend a dollar more if it wasn't going to make that big of a difference. So if you really like a program and you're like down to two programs and you don't know which one you're going to put first, that's when you do your second book. That's when you decide I'm going to go back and work with the residents for a day. Here's something I would have wish I would have known is that the, the dinners. I didn't know this until one of the programs, like somebody, one of the attendings told me this, is that the dinners, they, the residents choose a lot of the applicants at the dinners. Oh, I know. They, especially Vegas, he, one of the attendings told me, he's like, you should go to the dinner, it's important. Like, all the residents choose their applicants at the dinner, so don't watch those. Like, yeah. like if you're on, I, I did a few times, like I was in IC, ICU rotation, and instead of flying in like two hours before to go to the dinner, I missed the dinner just to go to the interview. And and it made, yeah, I was with Carpania. And uh, it really, it, it does hurt you, though, actually. They say they're not required. They say, they're yeah. Technically not, but they're, they're not. I mean, it's only required. beneficial for you to go. But it makes a big difference, and you don't know that. All that being said, I, I did go I'm to the dinner to the place that I matched at, so. Yeah, it's, okay. it's just a good way to get to know the residents. So. Cool. Do you guys need to know that? Yeah. What's that? Do you guys need to know how the match works? Please give it. Number one. Oh, but I would like to say one thing because I didn't know this going in about the match. It's actually in your favor, believe it or not, right? So if don't don't rank your programs based on oh they've said they liked me because if they really did like you and you ranked them three and your first two didn't rank you high enough, you'll just you'll hit you'll catch on it. So it doesn't matter. It favors your selection, yeah, not there's, theirs. There's no gaming it. It's random how you want to go yes, to it. Yeah, I didn't know that at first. So I didn't know. And what did you guys base your decision? I mean, for me, my decision based on location. Oh, gut. For me, gut and the program director specifically. He was just, he was so fun to work with just the day we were there. So what did you guys, how did you guys make your decision? I have something else to uh, Start with Dave, what's going on? Because this is important, right? Yeah, you know me. Uh, project, Dane. Uh, Use your real voice, Dane. Your outside voice. Okay. Um, so for me, it was mostly the people that I worked with. So it was mostly the people that I worked with. I had done a rotation at uh, my top choices, and so it was pretty straightforward for me. I also knew that I wanted to be somewhere in like the Midwest or Texas. For those of you who don't know, Texas is freaking awesome for emergency physicians. Um, and I'll let you do that research, but. Uh, there's yeah a lot of other things. I mean, you want to look at the other residents that you'd be working with. You want to look at the attendings. You know, other people who are going to be um, uh, other services are just going to be from the jerks. Um, what's the salary? What are the benefits? Um, what area are you going to live in? If you're married, what does your spouse think? Or is your significant other? Um, there's a lot that goes into that kind of stuff. Be top two. Top two. Yeah. Top two. Yeah. Top two criteria would be the people and then. Location and just gut feeling, feeling how I felt during the interview or dinner or whatever. So I only I only inter I only applied to locations I was okay living in. So the location was, I mean, it was important in the first step. So I it wasn't as much in my whatever it's called my rank list. I would say my whole rank list was gut feeling. I mean, you're just there and you're like. I did a couple I thought I was going to love, and I was like, if I have to come here, I might kill myself. It's awful. And so I didn't rank a couple that interviewed that, and um, I think, I honestly, it's just all good. They have all these algorithms. I think they're all crap, but it means that we can. So I would say, I would say attendings, residents, and location. And then something I didn't take into. into three, that's 3904. <laughs> but this is, the, this is the point, though. This is the point, is that I, stuff that I didn't take in consideration that I, Wish I would have. Is EMR systems? Oh. <laughs> Good lord! Yeah. You're they gonna all go suck. EMR systems if you. Epic is the best. Don't listen to him. Totally. Totally. This is dumb. Let's turn your second. I would oh, say no. you're done. You're <laughs> <talking about that. laughs> EMR systems. Look at that because it, it's what you're working on the whole time you're there. It that's sucks. Like that. That's a dumb. <laughs> <little fight. laughs> and then <laughs> rotations. That's my five. That's good. That's, that's good. Ninth and your tenth. That's good. The ninth and tenth rankings. So, 
So mine was based on location, and then I ended up in Detroit, go figure. <laughs> my second one was, I, like I, Detroit. I, I actually, I like to be shot at distance. Um, my second one was, I really wanted a, a really high acuity, uh, a lot of trauma, and, and being involved in trauma. There's some programs, <coughs> you not you don't even set foot in the trauma bed, believe it or not. Uh, emergency medicine is not even involved with that. Um, so high acuity, high volume. You want to see the sickest patients because that's how you learn. So um, I did the same thing as you did. Um, got feeling, and then I did not need that. <laughs> and um, I also wanted a place where I saw really sick people and a lot of trauma. And so JPS is the old county hospital for that area to see everything. Yep, my people and location. Um, I guess uh, my experience was on the. Um, ACGME side, you'd be hard pressed to find a program that's not a good training program. So, and you're going to learn everything you need to learn with a couple of nuances. But just, I, I just went by gut feeling and how I would picture my family living there, and uh, pretty happy with how everything ended up. So, all right, questions? Who is that? That's Ryan. Where is Ryan? He's in California. Uh, God all right. God bless, God bless that man. That you guys have any specific questions? I do. Okay, so, I, so wrote, this rotation, I did this rotation. Is this, this, or, uh, this is Will Cox. Cox. Did you? Yeah, Bushman. Uh, that's, that's if like if anyone still said their schedule, it's Will Cox here in one of the trashiest little towns in the United States of America. <laughs> it's family medicine. It's amazing. <laughs> he lets you do everything. My first day, he didn't know what skill level I had. I did an excisional biopsy on a guy's face and his neck. <laughs> He's got two basal cells. Go take him out. So I went in there and I cut this guy's basal cells out and I sewed it all up. He wasn't even in, <laughs> in the room. It was amazing. He was in everything. And so, and since I don't have an EMS background, and so. I'm not used to starting IVs or needles or any of that stuff. And he does prototherapy, which is you do so many <coughs> needle stuff and so much procedures there. Like it was a great rotation just to get confident. Um, so if it's on your schedule, if you can get that on your schedule, it's an amazing rotation. Scott, what's going on? Good rural rotation. I I had my rural rotation already used, and I still chose to go out there. It was so awesome. Worst town. It sucks though. I mean, it's I'm like worst worst two hours from Tucson. Like south south of Tucson. I live in Tucson, so I had to go three hours from there. No, three hours. Three hours. Yeah. Three hours. The other rotation in third year. So I did a rural switch. I don't know if you can do that anymore. I did a rural switch. I did family down there, and I did a third year rotation at Banner Desert, um, which I'm not. It wasn't legal, but. Me and Jan are like this. It's seriously an amazing rotation. I one hundred percent think about it, and like only emergency medicine people do it because it's the busiest emergency department in Arizona, and so there's like five docs on at a time, and you're the only student. And so I probably did ten intubations, um, tons of LPs, tons of procedures I never did. I didn't do one intubation on an audition. I didn't do any. Okay. I didn't. That's a good point. You're not going to do a lot of procedures on additions because well, the hierarchy. So, I so if you want to get stuff yeah, done, Yeah, I did 10 as a third year at Banner Desert. So if you guys can somehow oh, finagle that into your schedule, I would do it because it's an amazing rotation. I'll, I'll Sorry, answer a specific my, question that uh, nobody's asked yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to uh, um, tout some programs. If, like, if I had to choose the most desirable program in the country, the University of New Mexico is amazing. So if you're set, set, scheduling um, audition rotations, you disagree? Well, no, they, they were, were great. Yeah, they were awesome, but they've only taken one DO yeah, in the past like 10 years. But they were super and friendly. So if you're, if you're if like setting up. member of someone who already went there. I, just out of curiosity, how many of you are interested in osteopathic EM programs versus just one, two, a couple? Not sure yet. <laughs> Then the other, so that would be like a dream rotation that I would say if you if you're gonna like set up one audition that you, you want like to see if a dream will come true, that's a great one to try. The other two that are super do friendly that I think are just like I never even had even heard of them. I kind of like threw a dart at the map and that's where it hit and I ended up out there. But Western Michigan is an amazing program, particularly if you're interested in EMS. Like it, it's probably the best EMS program out there and. Um, 
and super DO friendly. Like they bend over backwards to like make it to where <coughs> you, you get your AOA qualified internship and everything. And then the other program is the one that I'm going to, St. Luke's. That these are, yeah. these are programs that really impress me and like um, so, but they're not programs that you'd like that would be high on your radar. So St. Luke's is dual certified too. It's not. It's, it's separate. It's separate. It's they have it's a separate. DO program a DO and an ACGME program. It's program. so weird. Yeah. All right. Any questions from you guys? What was the name of the podcast that teaches you how to present a patient? EM Basic. EM Basic. Uh -huh. oh, okay. And there's, it's called uh, How to Present a Patient. I think. Yeah. It's Dr. Steve Carroll. He's actually a DO. Okay. Awesome. Uh -huh. EM Basic. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like I said, he's a little dull, especially once you listen to Emrah, he'll never want to listen to him, but he's good. Was there something that under one of you guys did or saw or <coughs> someone just essentially face planted and did something really stupid? And how could you ever possibly do that? That we should definitely avoid doing that we might not realize. Arming a patient. <laughs> you can't always control that. Yeah. I think like we can touch on a lot of them. I've seen people fail just by not getting toys. I've seen fail, people fail by not getting on rotation in time. I've seen people on rotations who are just social and that. Yeah, neat or dumb and they're like yellow nurses. I would say that. It's not your place yet. I, think, I, mean, I would say on the audition out. rotation, you need to be like <laughs> smart. <laughs> Something you might have yellow nurses. It's not you have to be smart socially on audition rotations. Because EM is a field where they, they're like, they want to be cool, they want to be cool people, they, you want somebody you like that you work with at 3 in the morning. Exactly. With 3 right? in the morning, so you just got 9 You don't want the egghead from internal medicine that's ranting about the ransom criteria. And, you know what I mean? Like, you want somebody that's enjoyable to work with. Like, hey, that's why I'm working with the internal medicine. I had a resident. I had a resident. I had a resident get really mad at me because I looked something up on Wikipedia. So she also got mad at me because I, I told that, the I so I was presenting and I said the patient's uh, ethnic background and she said, oh, yeah. "Don't ever do that unless it's relevant." And I was just like, "Really?" She was just looking for something to jump on me about. It was like my first day, first patient of my first audition. This is a 47 year old Ashkenazi Jew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, So. Something can touch on this again, boys. But don't worry. Don't fail your PE. That's pretty big face. I laugh now, but. I didn't laugh. It was funny at the time. You're a little bit about, like, you know, knowing differentials and being able to present differentials. You. What what are other things that you guys saw in your rotations that can help you kind of stand out from the crowd? Other Practice your suturing. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I've got something for that. You want to make sure that you know what the red flags are for a given chief complaint. Um, so that you can mention in your presentation that you didn't have this, this, or this. And so that rules out all of the major things <coughs> that uh, would be life threatening. So the red flags definitely. So the step beyond the differential then is the assessment plan. If you can put together a really good assessment plan, that's impressive. Because at your level as a fourth year medical student, you're expected to know a differential diagnosis um, and the life threatening things. But if you can if you can put together a good assessment plan, that will just be very impressive. And then like what Dane said is if you can follow your patient and then <coughs> come up with the disposition before your resident does, you know, say this lab stuff is back, they're okay to go, or this stuff is back and we need to admit them, like you'll, you'll look great if you can come up with that disposition and where the patient needs to go. I think you have to like learn how to be annoying. I think it's when, I think you're like super excited to be there and so there's some level of that. But like I think there's some you have to sometimes read your attending and sometimes they're really stressed and you have to say stop stop being annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to sometimes they're gonna have to put you to the side because it, it's a crazy day. So sometimes you just have to not say something people like Anyways. Anyone can go if you guys need to go. Yeah. We're, uh, We're late. Go. So you guys can go or stay. We, I think most of us are happy to answer any more That's questions. That's a question, that. actually. That's about one question. <laughs> <laughs> <It's totally laughs> Unlike on your audition, <laughs> you really can't go now. <laughs> I'm on my way. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so how many programs would you say okay, could apply to you for like, like block on VSAS? That's a good question. But yeah, I'll be there. Like you need like five to get one or like, you know? I would say seven, all of them, seven, all of them okay. and then you can choose. I think it's no, I mean, how many do you apply? Oh, okay. Like if I want to go I somewhere. I think I did three or four for block. Yeah. Block. But I think it's easier to get an audition rotation than it is to get an interview. Personally. Like, I mean, I, I got pretty much an offer to rotate it every place I apply. Some places won't. The yeah. scheduling is where it gets tricky. But actually, scheduling an audition isn't that difficult. Um, send an email to the program coordinator. coordinator, and they'll tell you what dates they have available. Some places will do VSAS and accept some people, just by put them on the schedule. I know that at three of the places I rotate that, they had just accepted some people to rotate there, and then they took some people from VSAS as well. But Really, auditions are kind of to get you to start early. And sometimes don't give up because I got my Vegas one like a week before it started. So that I, I calling which programs turned out is, being a yeah, calling them to check. I didn't do that for doctors. I actually applied to audition, and I guess I got a phone call like four weeks later saying I didn't get it, but other people did in between. So it's a good idea, you know, at the time just to keep calling, maybe once a week, just to check on the status, or maybe once every other week to check. So on it doesn't the status. it doesn't update automatically to them. Yeah, they have to do it manually, so if you call and they're like, oh, well, now it's open. Yeah, they're the coordinators, it's their job. Like, don't hesitate to contact and call and email them. That's what they get paid to do, is to help them out. So. He's going to come pick the mics. Okay. I want to keep mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this home. <laughs>